Welcome to Nursing 401's Finding a Keeper article. My name is Danielle Applebaum, and I am the Scholarly Communication Librarian at Farmingdale State College. At this point, you've already visited the library, so I know you've probably gotten a few studies bookmarked from your session with the librarian. But how do you know which studies are appropriate for this project and which to toss out? That's what we'll be going over today. This video has been designed so that you can follow along and evaluate your study as I evaluate the example study I've selected for this tutorial. I suggest watching the video all the way through first, then pull up or print out one of the studies you're considering for your project and walk through the criteria with me. Now before we start, it's important to note that what constitutes a keeper study for this assignment may not necessarily constitute a keeper study for another research assignment you may have. For classes other than Nursing 401, always confer with your instructor and or the assignment instructions to determine the materials that will meet the requirements of each individual project. So what does a keeper study look like? There are 10 characteristics you'll want to look for in a keeper study. The study is a randomized control trial, a cohort study, a quasi-experimental study, or a descriptive study. The study is published in a peer-reviewed journal. An abstract is present. The study was published within the last five years. The author or author's credentials and affiliations are listed. A literature review is present. Research questions or hypotheses are clearly stated. If applicable, funding source is disclosed. Data in the form of numbers and statistics is present. Protection of human subjects is evident. And the study can be repeated or replicated. Now, this checklist seems easy enough, right? But once you start to dive deeper into your studies, you may have questions like, how do I know if the study is from a peer-reviewed journal? Or what makes protection of human subjects evident? Don't worry, we're going to walk through each of these criteria, why they're important, and how to check whether or not your study meets them. For this assignment, you've been asked to select a randomized control trial, a cohort study, a quasi-experimental study, or a descriptive study. But what are these and how can you identify them when searching? Cohort studies are studies in which subsets of a defined population are identified. These groups may or may not be exposed to factors hypothesized to influence the probability of the occurrence of a particular disease or other outcome. Cohorts are defined by populations which, as a whole, are followed in an attempt to determine distinguishing subgroup characteristics. Randomized control trials represent work that reports on a clinical trial that involves at least one test treatment and one control treatment, concurrent enrollment and follow-up of the test and control treated groups, and in which the treatments to be administered are selected by a random process, such as the use of a random numbers table. Non-randomized control trials, aka quasi-experimental studies, are studies where participants are assigned to a treatment, procedure, or intervention by methods that are not random. Non-randomized clinical trials are sometimes referred to as quasi-experimental clinical trials or non-equivalent control group designs. Descriptive studies can be observational or cross-sectional. An observational study is a work that reports on the results of a clinical study in which the participants may receive diagnostic, therapeutic, or other types of interventions, but the investigator does not assign participants to specific interventions, as in an interventional study. Cross-sectional studies are studies in which the presence or absence of disease or other health-related variables are determined in each member of the study population or in a representative sample at one particular time. This contrasts with longitudinal studies, which are followed over a period of time. If you want to know what type of study you've found, start by checking out the abstract of your article or by heading to the research design section of the article. If you are searching for a particular type of study, enter your keywords for your topic and then, in the final field, input terms relevant to the type of study for which you are searching. Then, set the field to search only the abstracts of the articles contained in the database. Why do we care about peer review? Unlike newspaper and magazine publishing, the peer review process in academic journals is rigorous. When a researcher submits a study to a peer reviewed publication and it's determined to be within the scope of that journal's subject area, the editor passes it along to two or more reviewers. 
Not just any reviewers, though. Reviewers who are experts in the area about which the researcher is writing. After examining the manuscript, based upon the criteria such as originality, contribution to the field, sound methodology, and so on, the reviewers make one of the following determinations. Accept, accept with major revisions, accept with minor revisions, or reject. If revisions are required, it goes back to the author and the whole process starts again. This is why publication can be a really lengthy process and why it's so difficult to research emerging trends, technologies, and so on. But the trade-off for such a lengthy process is, overall, a high-quality, thoroughly vetted study. So how do you ensure that your study came from one of these peer-reviewed journals? First, use the strategies you were shown during your library session. Specifically, make sure that you are limiting your searches using the peer-reviewed limiter. But let's say that you forgot that checkbox. Should you go back and revise your search so that the peer-reviewed limiter is checked? Yes. Are you going to do that? Probably not. I get it. I was a student too. So here's what you can do. If you're still in the database, for example, CINAHL, you can often click the link beside source and this will take you to information about the publication. You want to look for the following. Under publication type, it should say academic journal, and under peer reviewed, it should say yes. Now, if you're working with Medline, it's a little confusing because everything is a periodical. So just head back to CINAHL, click publications, enter the name of the journal for which you're searching, and you'll get a neat little summary telling you if it is or if it isn't a peer reviewed publication. An abstract is just a summary of an article, and it's designed so that you can get a good idea of whether or not what's in the article is actually going to be relevant to your PICO question. It should hit all of the important points. Why the study is important and necessary, what was studied, how it was studied, what the outcomes were, and the implications of those outcomes. Sometimes it's not evident from your search results that your article of interest has an abstract. Always double check by opening the article PDF. Now, just so we're clear, an abstract may be a handy overview, but you still need to read the article. Academic publishing has a long history and a pretty large chunk of that history has been included in the databases thanks to the miracle of digitization. While that's great for folks taking a historical perspective on a number of topics, for you it means that there's more stuff to wade through to get to the most current, up-to-date research in a field that's advancing at lightning speed. So when looking for a Keeper article, make sure that the article's publication date is from within the last five years. This is where the publication date limiter comes in handy. Some will allow you to set a specific range, while others will allow you to use a date slider or a combination of both. Generally, author credentials are easy to locate. They are either at the very beginning or the very end of an article, and sometimes require following a footnote or an endnote. But what you want to think about here is if there are any issues with your author's credentials that may impact how credible your keeper study is. For instance, you might be researching the effectiveness of interventions for reducing patient anxiety before heading into surgery. If your author writes about how effective a particular pharmaceutical intervention is, and they work for the company that produces it, well, there's a conflict of interest. Or you might encounter a situation where an author has impressive credentials, just not in the area they're writing about. So you should ask yourself, does the subject area of the author's credentials qualify them to be conducting the research about which they've written in their study? Does the author's affiliation indicate that they might possibly benefit, financially or otherwise, from the study turning out in a particular way? A literature review provides a foundation for the study about which the paper was written. It essentially synthesizes all of the previous research on the topic of a study to determine what's been studied and how it's been studied, what hasn't been studied, and why what hasn't been studied needs to be studied further. Basically, a good literature review demonstrates that the researcher fully grasped the landscape of their area of interest and has conducted a new study that advances, rather than duplicates, knowledge about that terrain. Have you ever read an article and thought to yourself, what is this study actually trying to do? 
This may be because the research questions or hypotheses are not clearly or explicitly stated. Studies are designed to answer research questions or to test hypotheses. These elements are the foundation of the study. They drive the design of the study and the lens through which the findings are interpreted and communicated. A keeper study will have clearly stated questions or hypotheses. These will usually appear as bulleted points, but may sometimes appear as part of the text introduced by phrases like, the goal of this study is to, or the purpose of this study is to, or this study hypothesizes that, and so on. Just like author credentials, funding sources are sometimes located at the beginning or very end of an article, and sometimes require following a footnote or an endnote. Again, similar to thinking about author credentials, what you want to consider here is if there are any issues with the study's funding source that might impact how credible your keeper study is. For instance, you might be researching the impact and effective reduction of contaminants in drinking water. If your study is funded by a company that sells water filtration systems, well, there might be a conflict of interest. So you want to ask yourself, does the nature of the funder indicate that they might possibly benefit, financially or otherwise, from the study turning out in a particular way? Another element you'll want to look at in a keeper study is the presence of data and or statistics. Although a major aspect of any study is the interpretation of the results, the results should be backed up with data. So if the study says something like, using X intervention, a majority of patients experienced a return to normal blood pressure levels, it should include information such as the total number of patients that received the intervention and the number or percentage of patients for whom it had certain effects. For example, saying a majority of patients were positively impacted might mean 51 out of 100 were impacted or 99 out of 100 were impacted. Both could be described as a majority of patients, but these are very different data sets. It should also include information like statistical significance, which essentially helps us to understand whether the changes we might see from an intervention are potentially attributable to the intervention or just due to chance. Participating in a medical study can have adverse physical and psychological effects on participants. As such, researchers who engage with people whether in an observational or experimental manner, must guarantee the protection and autonomy of all human subjects with whom they interact during the course of their study. This is accomplished by the primary investigator's completion of training in the responsible conduct of research and approval of the study by an institutional review board, also known as the IRB. This information may be included as part of the text of the study, or it may be included towards the end of the study. A study should provide enough detail so that you or another researcher should be able to carry out the same exact procedures. Why is this important? Well, first, theoretically, if you were to conduct the same exact study with a similar population, you should be able to glean similar results. If not, this might mean that the research design is not sound, or it might mean that there are one or more variables that weren't accounted for in the first study. In both cases, this helps other researchers make gains in improving existing research. Either you learn how to improve how to research the problem of interest, or you learn additional details about how complex the problem of interest is. When you encounter a study that lacks enough detail to replicate the study as is or with other populations of interest, be wary. It might just be an issue of poor communication about the design of the study, or worse, it might be intentionally vague to cover up design flaws or ethical missteps. Now that we've taken a deep dive into what makes a keeper study a keeper, it's your turn to determine if the studies you located during your library visit truly are keepers. Click the keeper study assessment link to access the online form that will allow you to walk through the evaluation process step by step. You'll receive a copy of your evaluation by email.